Right, hello everyone. Good morning. Um, it's nice weather here. I don't know what it's like where you are. Um, so it's now 10 o'clock. Um, obviously people will still be um, arriving. So I'll just um, do a few housekeeping introduction and stuff. Um, so like if any of you's already previously attended any of our webinars, um, unlike Zoom meetings, we won't be able to see or hear you. Therefore, if you have any um, general things you want to say, then you can use the chat. Um, however, it's worth remembering that if you want to write something in there, you need to change it to say to all panelists and attendees and not just the panelists. Otherwise, only myself or Ben would be able to see it. Um, if you have any questions for myself or Ben, um, we will aim to address them at the end, a question and answer session. Um, therefore, if you want to use the Q&A function for that, which is separate to the chat, um, you can put your questions in there and um, I'll either try and answer some of them as we go along, but if there are any that I think would be beneficial for everyone to sort of hear about afterwards, then we'll save that for a session at the end. Um, so we're going to be doing uh, Pinewood and Juniper Scrub with Ben Averis today. Um, ben is probably, I'm almost certain, going to be keeping his camera off just because of bandwidth issues as we found that out for the first time. Um, if you have any problems with Zoom um, and you get kicked out or your internet drops down, you can just join with the, the same link again. Otherwise, if you, you, know, you can't return, um, then this whole session is being recorded and you can watch it on our YouTube channel later on in the week. I think um, we've had a lot of feedback about the fact that these sessions can be quite long and um, sometimes people need maybe um, a nature break. So I think what we'll do is we'll aim to have a short five minute break um, at approximately halfway through. Um, I'll sort of um, liaise with Ben about when that is, just so everyone can go and have a comfort break. Um, the other thing that I briefly wanted to talk about was um, it might be that a lot of you who are watching today are particularly um, based around in, in Scotland, um, just because of the habitat that we're talking about. Um, therefore, I just wanted to let everyone know that we're going to have a, a Scottish virtual volunteers event on the 2nd of July. I haven't actually put it on the website yet, but I thought if you wanted to mark that in your calendars as something that you'd like to join in with and meet some other Scottish NPMS volunteers, then that's something you might be interested in. Okay, so Ben, if you would wish to turn on your uh, microphone, um, but I understand that you'll keep your camera off, so that's fine. Mm. Hello, Ben, how are you okay? Hello. Good morning. Morning, morning. Can you hear me okay? Well, yes, I can hear you absolutely fine. It's all that's good. <clears throat> that's, that's good. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Uh, I will just go on <clears throat> to the first slide for you so that it's got the introduction. Thank you. And... Um, Think about what you were saying about having a wee five minute break halfway through. Um, yeah, that's 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 good. And do you want to just sort of say when that's going to be like, whoa, let's just have a five minute break here? Because that's fine. I mean, wherever it is will be OK yeah. by me. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Um, I'll sort of gauge the time and, and where you are in the in the thing and I'll let you know. So that's no problem. Yeah. So I'll just keep rattling on. Until... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely fine. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, I will. I will stop my video now, and I'll turn my microphone off, and uh, I'll leave it to you, Ben. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thanks. So, hello, um, everybody. Um, thirty-six folks here. I can see thirty-six participants. Hello, and um, thanks. Thirty-seven. Uh, thank you for um, for joining us on this uh, <clears throat> this kind of illustrated tour through the native pinewood and juniper scrub NPMS habitat. And the, um, the next slide has got a photo of an example of the pine wood, um, native pine wood, and there's some juniper in there as well. And um, <clears throat> you see how it's quite a dark looking um, habitat there. That fits for me to have written one of my miserable introductory habitat poems about this habitat. So I'll just uh, begin with this bit of uh, a bit of misery just for some fun really so pine and juniper yeah the winters are cold and flowers are few the pine trees are old and the feeling is blue juniper leaf dark as can be needle of grief on a wretched wee tree juniper pine trees of the place where the sun don't much shine and the wind chills your face it'll frost it'll freeze even summer's not warm no help of these trees in the darkening storm to the pines in the heather, you go at a price for the murk and the weather 
not very nice. To enjoy the old pines in the shivering cool is one of the signs of a miserable fool. So, um, if we're all going to be miserable fools and uh, <laughs> proceed through this uh, wee presentation here. Um, I'm joking, of course, when I uh, refer to all these things being kind of miserable because they've got a lot of interesting, interesting things. But somehow I just feel reluctant to start of saying things like, oh, this is all going to be nice and happy and everything's so, so interesting because people say that about all sorts of things. Maybe people have had enough of that. Anyway, um, native pine wood and juniper scrub, uh, pretty straightforward habitat compared with some of the other NPMS habitats in that it's, it's fairly kind of narrow in its definition. It's, it's got two components, native pine wood, which refers to wood, uh, woodland dominated by um, Scots pine within the native range of Scots pine, that's in the Scottish Highlands. Um, and that can also actually include some um, plantations, not really the sort of obvious young plantations, but someone's put a thing there saying, could you enlarge the slideshow? Um, maybe that's dependent on particular people's screens, actually, because uh, it's looking big here. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, the, the, it's quite common to find within that part of the Highlands where Scots pine is a native species to find plantations that have been there for long enough that they've developed a good ground flora, usually a kind of heathery, heathy kind of ground flora. And um, and you can look at it and think, well, I don't know really to tell very obviously whether this is a, um, an old plantation or, um, or a bit of native woodland that happens to be, happens to have a canopy that's all of more or less the same kind of age of trees. Um, so those are included as well, those kind of um, matured plantations. Um, and as I say, the heat, the ground floor tends to be pretty heathy, a lot of things like heather and blaeberry, as we'll see um, very soon with some of the particular species we get. The juniper components of it, juniper scrub, you can get some juniper growing in the pine woodland habitat, but the other kind of um, habitat type that belongs within this broad habitat is juniper scrub, which is basically kind of scrub dominated by juniper bushes, just um, like um, like you get gorse scrub, these patches of this dark stuff scattered around the place. It looks a bit like that actually, when the, um, compared, it looks a bit like gorse scrub that isn't in flower. But when you get close, you find the bushes are juniper, not gorse. Um, it doesn't include juniper scrub in kind of more lowland places, especially further south. There's, there's juniper down in um, southeast England. So <clears throat> juniper um, on um, at low altitudes and on places like sandy or calcareous soils and shingle um, in coastal places is not included here. So this is a northern, both these habitats are northern. Um, the pine in the native pine range, which is basically Scottish Highlands, although some people argue that maybe there are one or two sites in the Cheviots and actually in the west of Ireland, possibly, where there's native pine. But for this purpose, it's, we're talking about Scottish Highlands. Juniper scrub habitat is within the same geographical range there, but also it comes further south into the southern uplands of Scotland and parts of northern England, like there's a lot of it in the Lake District. Um, and it's in the North Pennines as well. And it's mainly both these habitats, juniper one and pine one, mainly on um, acid soils. So they have quite a lot of shared species in their ground floor. <clears throat> okay, if we go on to the next slide and we can start looking at some of the habitats that we might confuse the pine juniper habitats with. Although confusion is not probably not going to be a, a huge big deal here because, um, yeah, as I say, they're quite really, really quite well defined. However, pine. Um, in the pine woodland, you can often get birch trees and maybe some around as well, and sometimes oak in some places. Right? Um, birch about the most common other species of tree. And um, it's one of the things that sometimes you might ask yourself when you're in um, some woodland that's got a mix of pine and birch. You know, do we call this native pine habitat or do we call it the, um, the broadleaf woodland habitat? Uh, really just the um, balance between the amount of birch and the amount of pine, really. And, and also to check if we're looking at um, a homogenous canopy that's got a sort of intricate mix of the two species, in which case we can figure out which one, has, which species has the greatest amount of cover. Or maybe we're looking at a mosaic, a fine, fairly fine scale mosaic of 
patches that definitely are pine dominated, and we call that pine woodland, or pat and maybe smaller uh, patches that are birch dominated, in which case that's two separate habitats in a mosaic rather than a single habitat. You can get a single habitat that's intermediate between two different habitat types. That's very common, whatever kind of classification of habitat we're using, even the national vegetation classification, which has got loads of different, different categories, you still find areas that are homogeneously intermediate between two types. But generally, I think it shouldn't be too much of a bother to um, decide whether we're talking about the pinewood one or the um, birchwood one or a mix of the two. Um, another um, one, if we go on to the next picture, um, given that the ground flora in the pinewood habitat and quite a lot of the juniper habitat as well, especially the pinewood one, it tends to be heathy. It has an awful lot in common with heath vegetation, especially dry heath. Um, some of you may have been on the um, with heathlands when we had last week and be familiar with the, the dry heath habitat through that and from your own field experience, of course. Um, so here's a photo of um, native pine woodland and this heathland. And it can be a, a sort of tricky thing. There's no hard and fast rule, I think, really, as to how to define exactly where you would put a boundary between the pine woodland and the heathland because they can integrate very gradually. You can get scattered pines just gradually thinning out <coughs> um, into heathland. Always a kind of um, thing that you have, just have to make some kind of assessment and not not try and get too bogged down with figures and you know be, be, because as soon as you start trying to use a particular bit of methodology for it then you find that some part of the habitat you're looking at is it's um it's so much more gradual phasing out one into another that it's it's quite tricky we had this just recently we were doing some field work in Aberdeenshire and the site looked a bit like this and in fact this one is in Aberdeenshire this photo here um and having to map um, uh, mosaics of pine woodland and heathland where the pine was, uh, pine woodland was pretty open. Um, but anyway, where the, uh, you can usually get um, a pretty realistic indication just use, using some judgments. And if you've got a few, um, if you have a mix of the two, then some kind of idea about the density of the, of the pines, obviously where they're high density, you call it the pine woodland. Um, but yeah, just to let you know, they do really integrate in ways that could be confusing if you were trying to um, map them in, in um, immense detail. Uh, next picture shows that um, the top picture there for juniper scrub, we don't though tend to have much of a problem with uh, sort of transitions to other communities because the patches of juniper scrub tend to be fairly sharp edged, as you can see here with these ones in um, uh, sort of um, central high wall, sort of space side ish area. Um, amongst heaths that have been burnt actually so there's quite a complex pattern of um, heather burning in that photo as well but you can see how the juniper patches are really pretty well defined um it tends to be sharp edged and suddenly you're into dense juniper um the bottom picture is another one with pine um not only can pine wood really sort of grade out gradually into dry heath it can do the same into wet heath and in bog as well and this is sort of area of um, bog and wet heath here in um Speyside with pine just gradually thinning out and into it in some very small patches of kind of stuff that you could almost equally call very open pine wood or bog stroke heath with scattered pines. Um, so it's floristically, the pine wood has quite a lot in common with heaths and even with some bogs. Um, next picture is some pine that um, looks the part in terms of the structure of the trees they look you know they're not they're not sort of obviously plantation looking although it is actually plantation this is outside the native range of pine this is just up the road from um, from where i am now um but yeah so it looks good although the ground floor is not very heathy it's pretty grazed but um even if it was heathy we wouldn't really be able, wouldn't be able to call it that habitat we're outside that native range and I've mentioned again about the lowland juniper scrub, which doesn't count here on the calcareous or sandy soil, soils and places. And it's that lowland juniper scrub doesn't tend to merge geographically with the juniper scrub that we're talking about in this presentation today. Um, they're, they're sort of really, really well separated. So it's not like you're going to have to be mapping stuff or looking at some place and thinking, well, that bit over there maybe is the 
the juniper scrub that doesn't count and this bit here is the juniper scrub that does it's not they, they they're they're way separated further apart um and the next picture which is the last of these ones of um related floristically related habitats is heath that's got dwarf juniper growing in it so it's the same species but um this subspecies nana the dwarf one and this you can have a lot of juniper here but um it doesn't count in the native pine juniper habitat because it's a heath belongs in the heathland habitat um the, it's easy to tell them that the juniper grows kind of flat on the ground very very low um, a lot of that juniper can be found in pretty windy, windswept sort of places or rocky places. Um, no real problem in telling that that's a, a heath. Um, it's a different subspecies of juniper for the most part, which grows very flat. Its leaves can be slightly less sharply pointed as well. Um, although in some places it's been reckoned that the very low growing juniper actually it belongs to subspecies communists and it's just actually growing very, very short, probably as a result of the environmental conditions where it is being quite high up and in a very windswept place. But either way, you won't have any great bother separating juniper, you know, heath with low flat grown juniper from um, the more taller juniper scrub. Um, so if we carry on the next picture, starting to look through some of the, um, the characteristic species Obviously, pine, um, Scots pine is one of them. Um, re fairly readily recognised species of trees. You see that reddish colour on the trunk. Um, it's one of the particular features of it. And um, interestingly enough, it's not listed on the NPMS positive indicator list from uh, for, for this uh, this habitat. But you know, um, it, if it's going to be pine woodland, you've got to have it in there. So it's expected. It's just so um, universal through the through the pine wood. Um, and uh, the if we we can go on from here, I just thought I'd put some pictures of that because it's an important, obviously an important species in this habitat. These these ones here though are listed as NPMS positive indicators. Positive indicators, as you probably know, means they're things that are recognised as being there. A good sign that um, things that it's really maybe shaping up to be a pretty decent example of habitat um, compared with negative indicators which we'll see later on where they can indicate that maybe something's not right maybe some uh, some problem okay juniper is a positive indicator that's a close-up of a bit of its shoot with its um, spiky um, needle-like leaves what did i say needle of grief in that poem they are pretty sharp and um they come in whirls of three so if you were handed a twig of some um some juniper but um, by somebody who said what's this and you had no idea about the size of the, the tree or where where it was from or anything the fact that as long as it's it's a british species the fact that the um, needle-like leaves are in whirls of three, three all coming out in the same part of the stem, um, will separate it from all others, uh, which have leaves that are either just born singly or um, in pairs, like Scots pine. Um, so, um, and it has, uh, it's kind of uh, officially as cones are actually sort of berries, they look like berries, start off green and then they go a kind of uh, purpley, bluey, purpley colour. Um, the two birches, their photos of their leaves to um, show the typical leaf shape for each species, which is quite different from each other. The um, the downy birch, Betula pubescens, has some more kind of oval to diamond shaped thing with leaf with um, teeth fairly regularly spaced all the way around. Um, compared with the silver birch, which is a bit more um, jaggy looking, those sort of double teeth, some some of them every every so often there's a longer tooth sticking out. Um, and the end of the leaf is drawn out into a longer, sharper point. In a way, it's kind of a more lively looking leaf shape, you might say. Um, not that there's anything um, boring and tedious and staid, whatever, about the, the downy birch leaf. They're beautiful leaves. Rowan um, leaves are a bit like ash leaves with leaflets arranged in pinnate fashion in um, pairs left and right, you know, along the central leaf stalk, and then another one at the end. But you can always tell it 
from ash um, by looking at the arrangement of the main leaves up the twigs in ash there in opposite pairs and in round they're not. Um, obviously if you've got clusters of white flowers or later on if you've got clusters of red um, berries you'll know that it's not ash. Another thing is the leaflets, see they're quite shortly pointed, they, they come in quite abruptly at the end there. Um, in ash they're a bit more longly pointed and the end leaflets they tend to get longer really bigger towards the end more in ash than they do in the round yeah. the biggest ones there about halfway along um, so uh, and you're not so likely to find ash growing in the pine juniper habitat because the soils in general are more on the acid side and ash doesn't really like so much of an acid soil okay on the next um, slide we've got those um, ground dwelling heath type um, species of the, um, of the heathy layer, sub shrub layer. The three on the left are kinds of heather, um, the three on the right are, are sort of greener looking um, things with leaves that are broader or different in some other way so, um, and not with those big pinky flowers. So the, of the um, no, these are all positive indicators except for cross-leaved heath, by the way, though in the middle one. Um, Heather, of the three pinky flowered ones, Heather's got the smallest flowers and the smallest leaves, and the flowers are really, really pale as well. Um, and it's about the commonest overall of those three on the left. Bell Heather, um, it kind of prefers rather dryish kind of ground whereas the ordinary heather goes right across the range from the pretty dry soils to really quite wet it grows in bogs even so the bell heather it likes it drier it's got bigger flowers and they're a nice dark rich pink color purpley pink and the leaves are in whirls of three and they're much longer than the leaves of heather you can they're, they're, they're sort of long and narrow parallel sided a bit like the leaves of um lady's bed straw funnily enough um but that has got leaves in worlds of more than three and it has different flowers. Cross-leaved heath has greyer leaves in worlds of four and the flowers are in a more of a small cluster at the tip of the stem and they're sort of paler than the bell heather but um, a bit darker than the ordinary heather leaf. A lovely colour actually, cross-leaved heath. Kind of subtle pale pink that goes well with the subtle greyish colour of the leaves and it likes damper places, damp peaty places like wet heaths and bogs and damp um, pine woodland. Um, the three on the right, Bilberry stroke Blaybury, Blaybury's Scottish name. I wrote a poem about that and said it last week, but I won't repeat that this, this week, partly because I can't find that piece of paper on this table at the moment. Anyway, um, it's got broad leaves that are not evergreen and, um, and so they fall off in the autumn. They can often turn quite a nice bright reddish colour before they fall off. And uh, it's got those edible berries, beautiful plants. You can always tell it because see those green stems there, they're the woody stems, they've got longitudinal ridges running down their length. Um, none of the other of these heathery type things have um, stems like that. The only thing that you're likely to confuse that with actually is broom, which is a much bigger kind of shrub, but that's got remarkably similar green stems with those ridges running up and down their length. Um, Cowberry looks a bit like blaeberry, but it's evergreen and the leaves are much darker and more leathery and they um, they don't have those little distinct teeth along the edge. The edges tend to be kind of inrolled. Um, so even if they did have woods, they kind of have very, very slight teeth, but they're, they're kind of inrolled. So they look quite smooth edged and the berries go red. Um, it's a more northern species that um, in Britain as a whole which is why it can figure quite prominently in the native pine and juniper habitat, which itself is pretty northern. And the same is true of crowberry, basically northern, colder parts of the country. Uh, leaves a bit like bell heather, except they're thicker, tougher leaves. Um, they can be in whorls, sometimes they're not in whorls. Uh, but you can always tell it from bell heather or any one of these, or one of these dwarf shrubs by that white stripe running along the underside, middle of the underside of the leaf, really distinct. That has berries as well that go very dark blackish colour and they're quite nice to eat actually I don't mind you don't hear much about people eating empetrum berries but um, yeah they're okay not sure about cowberry yeah I think they're, they're all right as well but blaeberry is the best ones okay next picture has got some ferns and uh, these are all NPMS positive indicators 
and they're pretty easy to recognize, especially the hard fern on the left, because its fronds are very leathery, quite tough textured. They can go quite dark um, over, over time through, through the summer. They start off with a reasonably bright kind of green. And um, they're, they're not divided um, anymore you know, beyond just those single pinnates. So it's just, just a sort of um, one pinnate, you could call it. Um, compared with the one on the right, the lemon scented fern, which has got lots of little divisions within those. So we'll see that in a bit. The one in the middle, the oak fern, it grows a bit like bracken in that it has a creeping stem under the ground uh, from which you get single shoots, one here, one there, and so on. Um, so you get patches of it compared with things like the hard fern on the left, which forms tufts, all, all these things coming out from the same place. Um, you're never going to mistake oak fern from bracken though, because it's much, much smaller. It's got a very thin, rather dark, wiry stem, and these beautiful, rather thin, textured and blunt tips um, pinules. There, it's it's, it's, uh, it's it's a very a very delicate thing. It doesn't grow very tall, um, so it's kind of like a miniature, very delicate bracken. And the stems, the stalks in there, are so thin and wiry. It's almost sometimes as if you can't properly see them. Even even that photo shows that. that that can give the illusion of these bits of kind of leaf-like material floating above the ground somehow. Um, easy species to identify. Um, the one on the right, lemon scented fern, is a very tufted thing and it's a bit bigger and it looks superficially very similar to some of these other tufted ferns like the Dryopteris species, the, the butler ferns and male fern um, and lady fern as well. Um, but you can tell it from those because the um, well, if, first, if you if you look if you were to look close um, at the final divisions that you can see in that photograph, um, if um, you, you you couldn't tell it from looking from zooming in on this photo, but if you were actually with the real thing and you were look, you were looking closer, you would see in most of those tufted fern species lots of a number of little little teeth along the edges of those final divisions. But in the lemon scented fern, you don't really get those. So it's a slightly simpler look to it. And the, um, the main side pinnae in most of those other big tufted ferns, as you look further down and down the main stem towards the ground, there'll come a point where you lose those, where, where they stop and you've got a reasonable length of stem that doesn't have any. Whereas in the lemon scented fern, what they've done is they've carried them down I don't say what they've done, whoever they were. I don't know, but, um, they've carried them down, getting getting um, shorter and shorter and shorter, right down to pretty much down to the base of the stem. Um, so it's an interesting looking thing. I never, I mean, I can never really get much of a lemony smell from it. I think I've rubbed the fronds and smelt it. No else, but it's kind of a leafy smell. People vary, don't they, in their sense of smell? Um, okay, next um, next picture, uh, whizzing back to the birches. I didn't get around to saying about the bark. The silver birch um, has got bark that, at least on the more mature trees, it can get really fissured and grey. Thinking of how, you know, it's called silver birch, it sounds like silvery, and, you know, and the kind of whitish colour of the young bark of birches generally. You think, oh yeah, that's a good name, but actually, you don't get much of that silvery colour at all in the lower parts of the trunk of a more um, mature silver birch, these deeply fissured grey um, trunks and the whole tree can be quite big, uh, quite sort of um, definitely a single main trunk growing reasonably straight and tall compared with the downy birch which is a bit more kind of uh, irregular in its overall growth form as you can see from that one on the right there and tends to have the branches, side branches starting from somewhere lower down um, and the texture of the bark on the trunk, you get those so that sort of pale stuff with those horizontal thin dark lines, uh, very common in birches, well that persists a bit more with age on the um, downy birch, but it gets mixed up with darker patches in a kind of irregular patchy sort of way. So the two species, from the point of view of the growth form of the tree and the nature of the bark, they can look really quite different, as well as the um, the difference in um, that I've mentioned before, which I've said about the bottom of the page, um, asking what was that now about the teeth and the tips of the um, the two different species of birch. 
Um, we can go on to the next page, not waiting for you to answer that before we come to the next page. Um, and um, there's some more about the birches. And that one on the left, what do you reckon that is? Well, I've said at the bottom of it. <laughs> it's um, it's downy birch because it's kind of, um, you see that irregular look to the growth form. Um, there's mature, very mature trunks, but they've still got that patchy, well, it's kind of patchy, um, the smoother bark and the rougher stuff mixed in also with patches of um, mosses and liverworts. Some of that dark purpley colour is uh, a liverwort, um, the genus Frulania, um, which further further west you go, you get more epiphytes on these trees. The one on the right, that's just for a, a bit of interest, is um, to show how different some of the other birches can be. That's um, the stand of Betula ermanii that I was doing some work in, in where I was doing some work in Japan. Um, amazing looking trees. Uh, growing quite tall and straight in this photo. There's another photo of that same species further on, and you'll see how they look completely different as a result of different kinds of um, different kind of climate. Um, and that's a bit of an aside, that is. But oh yeah, talking about those birch leaves, just as a quick reminder, silver birch has them with double teeth and a longer, sharper tip compared with the the single teeth and the shorter, slightly blunter tip of downy birch. So the silver birch has that jaggy. Um, kind of lively uh, in a way look to it. Okay, we can if we go on to the next page now. We can move away from the trees and the heathers and see what other things are growing um, with them. And uh, also, these ones on the four on the four on this page are NPMS positive indicators in this habitat. Uh, and the first one, sweet vernal grass. On the whole, that's not as common as the next one, wavy hair grass, which is really so common on so many acid soils, whether it be in heath or bogs or woods. Um, sweet vernal grass, not quite so common in this habitat as the wavy hair grass. Anyway, if you've got those um, those sort of flower heads, kind of oval shape, they're not branched with these long, slightly shiny green um, spikelets, and they come up, they're, they're up at this time of year. Um, already it's one of the earlier flowering grasses and they they die off to a sort of pale um, goldeny fawn colour and they can persist for a good long time well into the winter which really helps to um, from identification point of view so quite distinctive if you just got the leaves one of the ways you can tell that species is that at the base of the leaf blades you've got quite a lot of hairs that are quite long at the base of the leaf blades, that's where the ligule is, the little kind of little flap. You've got a ligule as well on this species, but you've got those hairs, um, and that's quite distinct. And also, you, the if you taste the leaves, they taste of almonds. Um, wavy hair grass has quite different uh, different leaves because the leaves of the sweet fern grass, I haven't illustrated them there, but except that you can see some just in the distance at the bottom of the page. They're a few millimetres wide, just like so many other grass leaves. But the wavy hair grass is one of those grasses whose leaves are really, really thin, just no more than about a millimetre across. So they're, they're so thin that you can't really say, oh, here's the upper surface, here's the lower surface. It's just a kind of a piece of wire. Um, the same is true of the leaves of some of the fescues, like the red fescue and the sheep's fescue um, and the mat grass, but they've all got distinct differences in other ways, like the fescues have an incredibly short ligule that is virtually invisible, whereas in wavy hair grass it's up to about three millimetres long. Um, and the mat grass has a leaf blade that um, is in, has a really dense tussock actually of leaves and a leaf blade that juts out at almost right angles to the, um, the sheathing part that carries on down stem and it doesn't grow much in woods anyway. Uh, wavy hair grass when it's in flower you've got that beautiful branched flower head with those little wavy um, stalks within it and a slightly shiny relatively large spikelets so it's quite distinctive um, grass very very common on acid soils and if so if you're in kind of pine wood a wood, a wood of pine or birch or oak um, where there's, especially if you've got kind of heathy type plants on the ground and you find a wiry leaved grass growing in there, that's much the most likely species for it to be. Wood anemone has some um, leaves that are a bit like buttercup leaves, very deeply divided in a palmate fashion. They come in whirls of three up the stem. So that's very distinct and flowers are really obvious as well. Uh, big six petal white flowers coming up in the spring. And it can form carpets on the ground. Um, yeah, you can get it in in some of the pine and juniper habitats, uh, but then there's quite a lot of pine 
um, especially pine wood habitat where you could go through and probably not see it. Uh, wood sorrel is all, all around one of the very commonest um, little herbs in woodland on acid soils. Leaves a bit like clover, um, but the veins aren't as some, um, the side veins of the leaflets aren't as sort of parallel and obvious as they are here in, um, uh, as they are on the on the clovers. They've got more, more distinct sort of veins and quite different looking. And there's some more of a kind of heart shaped leaflet as well on the wood sorrel and those uh, white flowers. Um, very low grown little thing can carpet the ground in some places and it likes very, it likes sort of mildly to um, reasonably acid soils. And on the next page I've um, uh, I've mentioned a bit more about the um, the difference in the leaves between the two and shown a picture of so, so occasionally you find a pinky flowered um, wood sorrel it's quite nice um, so there's also some questions here about um, the, um, the pink heathery type flowers so um, can you put them in order of the darkest one to the palest one? There were three of them. And another question here is what's, what species of dwarf shrub is this one, the photo at the bottom? Um, we haven't got any leaves or flowers on it. And um, a couple of more. How do you tell round from ash? And how do you tell Scots pine from lodgepole pine? And uh, when we go on to the next page, that last question might seem a bit unfair because we didn't talk about logical point. Anyway, the first ones, the um, the um, bell heather has the darkest of the pinks, and then the cross leaf teeth, and then the heather, ordinary heather, is the palest. Um, that thing with those green stems was the bilberry. Um, so yeah, you can always tell it because it's got those green stems with longitudinal ridges. Um, Brown from ash, the um, the ash one, ash it has leaves in opposite pairs. It's one of the best ways to tell it. Even when you haven't got any leaves on the tree, you can um, separate, do a lot of tree identification based on whether the buds are in opposite pairs or if they're alternate. Or if they're spiral, which is kind of like alternate, but a bit messed up, <laughs> but still singly um, along the stems. Um, and yeah, the flower, white flowers and red berries around. Um, and lodgepole pine, yeah, it looks a bit like Scots pine. It's not native. It's been planted a lot, especially on dampish PT ground in the hills. And um, it's a bit duller, all around a duller looking thing than Scots pine because its leaves don't have that bit of a bluey tinge to them. And its bark doesn't have that warm reddish orangey colour that you can get, at least in parts of the Scots pine um, stem, uh, stems. Um, and if you've got the cones, yeah, you get a sticking out bristly thing very commonly um, on the outside of the scales. So it does, it does look a bit different the closer you get to it, but it's duller. Um, and it's always it's a plantation species. Um, next slide has some more ground dwelling herbs with white flowers. Again, we had a wood anemone and we have the wood sorrel. These three are also, um, they're also NPMS positive indicators and they've got white flowers. Two of them are strawberries on the left. So they've got leaves, a bit like clover leaves, they're trefoil in that you've got three leaflets, but you'd never mistake these for clovers because they've, um, they've, they're, they're a wee bit bigger and the leaves have got loads of, or the leaflets I should say, have got loads of teeth along their edges, very distinct. And um, if they've got the flowers out, uh, that's distinct again, strawberry type, strawberry looking flowers. You can tell that in the rose family, they've got that similarity to things like tormentil. Um, the flowers are quite similar between the two species. The leaves are the way really to tell them. Oh, obviously, if you've got red berries, then it's a wild strawberry, the one on the left. The barren strawberry doesn't have fruits. But the leaves, um, even from, well, from above, you can tell, you can get a, a fair clue as to which species it is because the wild strawberries leaves are a bit brighter green, the veins are more numerous and more distinct, um, the teeth tend to be more numerous and a bit more jaggy looking. It's all together rather more kind of ordered than the duller, slightly bluey green leaf of the barren strawberry where you get fewer teeth, um, 
the, the toothing on the Baron's trophy is a bit kind of less decided, it's a bit less regular. And when you get to the end of the leaflet, um, in the wild strawberry, the final tooth tends to stick out further um, forwards than, than the ones to the sides of it, as you'd expect. This is the very tip of the leaf. But the barren strawberries one, um, it's like it's, it's sort of saying, oh, I don't know, I don't really want to go, I don't know if I dare to go any further forwards than that. It's um, so altogether, it's a bit of a sort of duller, more um, holding back, you might say, visually looking leaf on the upper side. But when you turn the leaves um, the other way around, which I can't do in this photo, of course, but look at the underside, then it's the barren strawberry that's kind of being a bit bolder because both um, both species have leaves that have got hairs all over the underside. But in the case of the wild strawberry, those hairs are held really close to the, um, the leaf surface itself, so close that you have to, you have to really look Pretty hard to actually see quite clearly that it's got hairs. Yeah, it, otherwise it just look quite smooth. At least the barren strawberry is bold enough to stick them all out and say, "Well, here's these hairs," um, and they're very, very distinct, sticking right out from the underside of the leaf surface. So, if in doubt, check out the underside of the leaf, um, sticking out hairs on barren strawberry. Heath bed straw, a wee little um, creeping bed straw, a bit like some other bed straws that have clusters of white flowers and that don't grow very big. But some of those other ones, kind of like marsh bed straw and fen bed straw, can get taller because they can scramble up taller plants in wet places. Um, what you can check out on the heath bed straw, if you're in any doubts, like maybe if you're thinking, could it be a limestone bed straw, which can look very similar and about the same size and is rather creeping as well. If you look, in, look close at the leaves, um, you get little hairs on their edges and the hairs point forwards. Whereas in the limestone bed straw, they stick out more and point, some of them point slightly backwards. Um, and then some of those other bed straws with white flowers, they've got little backward pointing teeth on their edges. And some of them um, uh, have uh, little backward pointing hairs down the stem. So that gives the whole plant a rougher texture. Uh, heath bed straw is smooth all around. And it's by far the commonest bed straw on acid soils generally really whether it be in grasslands heaths um, and and woods so easy bed straw to tell next picture has got another herb this is a very really good characteristic herb of these northern pine and juniper places because it's a northeastern species on the whole in britain chickweed wintergreen um, its leaves come up in a whirl and funny thing is they vary in size um, within the whirl. So it's like somebody hasn't got them quite right, maybe you might give that impression, but what's wrong with variation? It's not, it's not wrong, is it? Um, and so that irregularity of leaf size within the whirl is a way to tell it. Otherwise the individual leaves quite ordinary looking. Um, flowers a wee bit reminiscent of um, wood anemone in that they stick up in the general size. They're a little bit smaller, but um, where they've got more petals and they tend to be usually just a single flower per plant but you can get two or even three um, all on separate stalks coming up from that whirl so easy thing to identify there it is growing um, as you often see it when uh, the pink one on the right where the leaves have gone pink in the autumn growing with a big bulky moss uh, by the name of Phytididophus triquetris although I have to say now they've changed the name for that species it's now called her Hylocomia delphus triquetris, slightly a bit more of a mouthful. Um, but it's a um, that moss becomes particularly common on the ground in some of these northeastern um, pine and juniper habitats. And that photo on the right as well, you can also, also see the leaves of um, cowberry in the background, those evergreen little oval leaves. Um, so um, next picture, some more herbs. Mm. Gives me a time for a slurp of this coffee to keep my mouth considered to hopefully keep me from um, coughing. Get sometimes when you talk a lot, you kind of get a rough, sore throat. Have you ever had that? Uh, coffee all gone. Um, so, um, harebell actually, harebell's mostly a species of open, grassy places, especially quite dry, grassy places, but they can occur here and there in pine and juniper habitat where a bit of light comes in and the ground isn't too damp. Um, those flowers are really unmistakable, very delicate, beautiful flowers on very thin, wiry stems. 
the leaves are funny looking things the leaves up the stems that you can't see them in there photograph that the, um, upper most bits where there aren't any leaves but the leaves up the stems are very very narrow a bit kind of like grassy looking leaves a bit like short grass leaves um, and then the ones at the very bottom of the plant are a bit like small violet leaves they're completely different they're quite rounded to heart shapes on quite long stalks but they're and, and small they're little things um, so two different styles of leaf um, the bitter vetch is a plant of mildly acid grasslands and woodland and it compared with a lot of other vetches the number of leaflets on a leaf isn't very much actually two to four pairs but the it makes up for that with size they're quite big leaflets so quite big and lush well in some specimens they're actually quite they're really quite narrow but pretty long so in one way or another it gets a bit of size in there with those leaflets uh, to make up for the fact that there aren't that many of them and the flowers again you don't get that many flowers in a um, in a spike compared with things like tufted vetch where you get loads uh, but they're relatively big flowers and a beautiful pinky, purpley pinky colour. Um, so it's pretty easy one to recognise. I tend to find the specimens of bitter vetch that grow in the woods, they tend to be um, ones where the leaflets are quite broad rather than ones where they're really thin but pretty long. So it makes it even more recognisable. Common cow weeds, this is a thing that with the yellow flowers, very distinct, um, slightly snapdragon-y looking flowers. Um, if you didn't have the flowers, you might mistake it a bit for um, greater stitch words with those longish, narrow oval leaves in opposite pairs. Uh, but the stitch words leaves are greyer um, and it has a very distinctly square section stem. And the thing about the stitch words also is that you see how you've got a, like in the middle of that photo, you've got a pair of leaves coming out opposite each other. And then further down the stem, there's another pair of leaves opposite each other coming out in the same direction as well in the stitch work, they would be swiveled around right angles. So that when you look from above, it's almost like you've got four ranks of leaves. Um, so, and, and yeah, as I say, they're rather a greyer colour. Um, the common cowy could be quite common on, um, in some places on acid soils in woods and also in heaths. Okay, uh, moving on, some more herbs, a few more. Last page of these NPMS positive indicators. Violets. In the lists, the NPMS lists, it's got Viola raviniana stroke Reichenbachiana, but you won't find Reichenbachiana, that's the early dog violet. You won't find that in this habitat because it's more southern. It just about gets into the extreme south of Scotland as a native species. Um, it looks a bit like the common dog violet, but you see that pale coloured spur coming out the back of the flowers of the common dog violet. In the, heat, in the early dog violets, they're dark purpley colour, more like the colour of the rest of the flower. Um, so by far the commonest violet in Scotland is the, um, the common dog violet. Um, and also the early dog violet goes for more kind of calcareous soils anyway. So yeah, you know, we're not going to find it in this habitat. Um, stone bramble in the middle there, it's, um, its leaves look a bit like wild strawberry leaves, except the middle leaflet is on a little bit of an extra stalk of its own. So um, whereas you don't get that, it's just a, in, the, in the strawberries, all three leaflets all come out from exactly the same place. Um, it's related to bramble and it has little red berries and when it's when it's in flower it has white flowers really quite similar to bramble flowers it's not prickly thankfully and it's not that common it kind of creeps over the ground especially where it's rather steep and rocky in some places if it's not very grazed it can creep over flatter ground on the woodland floor um, not very not very extensively but it's pretty good find it's mainly in the upland um, upland woods of different kinds, including um, sort of just about the pine juniper habitat where you've got little rocky bits. Um, common mouse ear, slightly surprising thing to find on the NPMS positive indicator list for this habitat because it's mainly a grassland species, very, very common, related to stitchworts. Little leaves in opposite pairs, pretty hairy, the stems often tinged, slightly purple. The leaves are small, kind of oval, oblongy shape, and the flowers are like miniature stitchwork flowers with these those notched petals. Um, more of a grassland species, really, but if you've got a bit of relatively grassy 
um, pine wood or juniper, juniper scrub, and especially where a bit of light comes in around the edge, um, you could find it. Um, there's a couple of pages next of some, you might say, more exciting plants of the pine juniper habitat, especially the pine component, um, pine wood, uh, winter greens here. These, these aren't very common, but you know, worth looking out for if you do find them, things with some um, evergreen leaves that are roundish, more or less, the two species on the left, the common winter green and the intermediate winter green. Um, bit of a difference between the two in terms of um, the, some details of the shape of the leaf, the um, length of the leaf in relation to the leaf stalk and number of teeth around the edges. The intermediate winter green is not as common as the common winter green, but the common winter green is not a common plant. It's, they call it common winter green, but I'm always pretty excited to find any winter green. Beautiful plants. Um, and the flowers a bit like an orchid spike really, but they're pale sort of whitish colour and um, uh, slight differences, like the more projecting um, style thing coming out of the flower and the intermediate winter green. Serrated winter green, sort of similar, less common thing really. Um, rocky banks, it likes sometimes the woodland floor. Uh, you can tell it because its leaves are more pointed, whereas the two on the left have got really quite rounded, very blunt tipped leaves. Um, the serrated winter greens the teeth along the edges of the leaf are also a bit more distinct, slightly sharper looking. Um, in fact, the leaves of the serrated winter green look very much like bilberry leaves, but the whole plant's a bit more tufted. And even in the winter, you might find the old bit of a, um, a, a flower spike there. And so Sarah's saying, we'll take a break at 10.55. Oh, what time is it now? Hang on, that's about four minutes. That gives me time for concluding this page and maybe even go on to the next. This the one on the right is very rare. One flowered wintergreen, roundish leaves with lots of tiny teeth around them. If you see something like that, and then especially if you see a single um, stem with one flower on the top, then you're onto something really rare, the Monices uniflora. Um, in some pine wood places it grows. I'll see if I can, in the, in the four minutes before the break, um, go on to the next picture and we got a few more quick ones whiz through them. Twin flower, uh, leaves in opposite pairs along a creeping slightly woody stem and they're kind of evergreen and small. Uh, so a bit like wild thyme, but the leaves are bigger than wild thyme. So distinct thing, nothing else like that, forming these creeping patches um, with, of leaves in opposite pairs. And the flowers, a pair, if you're lucky enough to find the flowers there. Just, um, unmistakable. Creeping ladies' tresses is a kind of orchid with slightly translucent leaves, dull um, kind of olivey green, very smooth, no hairs or anything on them. Uh, funny kind of translucency to them, little tufts it grows in. And then the flowers are a, a kind of sort of spike, but not a very well ordered looking spike of, of white flowers. It's a pine wood species. And the lesser tray blade grows in damp acid places, especially among sphagnum mosses, as we can see there. It's like a miniature orchid. Well, it is a miniature orchid. It's not just like a miniature orchid. It is a very small orchid. Leaves, a bit like blaberry leaves in their size, um, green, but they don't have teeth on the edges. And they come in just a single pair at the bottom of the plant. And then you've got this very fine little um, uh, stalk with little brown flowers. It's, it's just a few centimeters tall little wee thing. Often you find little, um, lots of little plants of it scattered among sphagnum without any flowers even. Um, but um, you know, hunt around and you probably find it with some flowers. Grows among, usually where there's heather, well-grown heather and um, a damp mossy layer underneath, especially including sphagnum mosses. That can be in the pine wood and we can also find it in damp heaths and bogs outside the woods. Because that's about some um, time, is it, I think, for um, our break. My Clock, uh, clock on this week computer here says 10 53 um which yeah, is that's, that's maybe as near as <laughs> right yeah. now if that seems like a good place for you ben okay, so we'll yeah. resume again I... um at 11 o'clock on the nose um so everyone can just take a quick comfort break or make yourself another cup of tea or coffee or something okay we'll brilliant thanks okay You want to see? Oh. <laughs> 
Okay, Ben, are you are you ready to resume? Yep, yep. Um, with a freshly refilled mug of uh, coffee. Good. Um, everybody back? I think we assume so. Yeah. So, will I just carry on now? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just carry on. Yeah. Okay. Um, if we whiz on to the next um, next slide, um, where, yeah, of all this, now there's some more questions. If um, of all those species that we've been looking at, which which two um, stand out in their leaves are sort of inconsistent in some way, and um, what not only what are those species and in which ways do they, um, what kind of inconsistency or variability is there? Um, and what do common cowweed and twin flower have in common? And um, these, uh, the answers to these, the silly drawing there, the answers to these are on the next page um, where we can see that the inconsistent species in terms of something about the leaves are the chickweed wintergreen, where we got variability in leaf size within the whirl, um, and harebell, where we've got totally um, varied leaf shape. You, you wouldn't think they were the same species. They, I've shown them here. I didn't. They weren't visible in the previous photo. Harebell, if you had the flower, but you can see those upper leaves up the stems, which are so incredibly narrow. They're like kind of grass leaves a bit. Um, and um, and then those ones more like little violet leaves at the base of the plant. Um, and you can tell that they're not violets in that they're, ten, they tend to be a bit smaller than your average violet leaf, but the teeth along the edges um, are not as regular. Violet leaves, we only know them as being kind of heart shaped, but when you look close at most of the violet leaves, you find little teeth along their edges, quite bluntish teeth but they're pretty small and very regularly spaced. Um, whereas the harebell leaves, teeth along their edges are kind of irregular, fewer in number, more irregular spacing, a bit less decided looking. And the texture of the leaf as well in the harebell, usually not quite as sort of firm as your um, average violet leaf. Um, and the veins are a bit more irregular looking and sort of branched a bit more. Altogether, the violet leaves a bit more kind of ordered um, in their appearance, and um, oh, the yeah, the the twin flower and the um, the cowweed have both got leaves that come in opposite pairs, although the growth forms of the plants, of course, is so very different. Um, okay, if we go to the next um, slide, now we've got the those negative indicators that I mentioned uh, so I can indicate that maybe there's a bit of a problem. It can be often that maybe is the word uh, because sometimes in some sort of places they might not be. However, in the, for the species on the right, Froedodendron, I think that's generally always the problem. Anyway, starting on the left, stinging nettle, it's really because um, of its uh, in being an indicator of um, eutrophication. There's a particular reason for nettle to be um, on the negative indicator list for several of the MPMS habitats, actually. Um, the kind of eutrophication that could come from agricultural treatment of fields nearby or from sheep um, or even deer, from animal big herbivores, um, urine and dung, so on. If there's a concentration of that in places where the animals hang out quite a lot. Um, that is probably a bit more likely to be the case in the pine juniper habitat than um, fields, intensively managed fields nearby, because in the places where you get the pine and juniper habitat, you're less likely to find intensively managed farmland adjacent. There might be one or two places where you do, but in general, not so common. So it's um, not more likely to be something to do with concentration of um, animals. Um, creeping thistle, rather similar actually, but uh, disturbance from the ground, direct physical disturbance from things like trampling or sometimes vehicle use can um, also lead to an increase in the creeping thistle. And so those kind of increases um, in nutrient enrichment 
and associated disturbance in some cases as well, can um, allow certain plant species to become more common at the expense of some of the um, species that would more naturally be there. Um, creeping buttercup is another thing actually that can get more common where there's been some eutrophication. Of course, that can creep around and smother other plants. Uh, but um, yeah, nettle and thistle are particularly prominent. That's why they're good indicators. Uh, you can see them from more of a distance. Bracken um, can just cover big areas of ground, spreading with these underground stems, putting up these big fronds, dense patches of it, and that can um, eat into bits of pine and juniper habitats, as well as other kinds of woodland and grassland and heath and turn them into really very species poor stands of bracken with not very much else on the ground, apart from deep bracken litter that gets particularly dense. Um, so um, it depends, I mean, it's a native species and it does occur naturally in these kind of habitats, at least to some degree. So it's, uh, it's not necessarily always a problem compared with the rhododendron on the right, which is always a problem because it's non-native, invasive, and really takes over, smothers everything, uh, little can grow underneath it. Um, always the best thing to do is to get rid of it, which is, of course, much easier said than done, um, especially if you've got absolute messes of it. It's, uh, it's, it's a big job. So um, yeah, you see it in that photo, just smothering well, maybe all the ground all over there in, the, in some um, pine wood up in West Ross. Yeah. Okay. The um, moving on to the next um, slide, we got a number of uh, pictures here of things that are strictly speaking, I suppose they're not essential things for NPMS work, but things you might notice in the woods or that you could look for that um, that are in, in interest in various ways. Like um, I know the NPMS doesn't cover mosses. But that's not to say there's no reason to um, just kind of notice and look at the mosses in these habitats. Like native pine woods can be um, one of the best habitats to go in for anybody to, especially to start looking at mosses, because the mosses, a lot of them there are pretty big on the ground. You get deep masses of uh, uh, mosses of all sorts of different growth forms growing on the ground amongst the heather and the blaybury. Wonderful. Um, Place to look at these plants and um, this one Tyrium crista castrensis is one of the most beautiful of them all it's it's mostly in the north of Britain especially in woods of pine or birch um, like north facing woods but it likes the kind of cool climates which fits because it's a northern boreal to montane species in in Europe more generally it likes cooler places and it's got quite a thick stem and all these massive side branches and little curly leaves. A beautiful, beautiful site is uh, where, wherever you find that there's usually a kind of um, a habitat that's pretty decent in terms of maybe its naturalness or its general sort of quality. It's, um, it's the thing that you're, um, you're not going to find where there's been some eutrophication, for example. Um, Tylium and nettles wouldn't really go together. Plants are very acid ground that's infertile and that's um, a pretty good thing in the pine juniper habitat. Um, so the next, um, next picture is one of a few that are looking at variation in the makeup of the ground vegetation in pine woods. Um, because it's, it can vary, even though the habitat as a whole is quite restricted in terms of its distribution and its total extent, um, it does vary within. First one gradient of variation is from drier to damper, and that's uh, commonly related to slope aspects, like south facing, as we can see here, uh, where a bit more light gets in, a bit more warmth, so it tends to dry things out a little bit more as so you can get a lot of bell heather on this on the south in the south facing pine wood for example and um it's uh, in in big contrast to the next picture which is on a more sort of northerly aspect um which and also further west where it's damper generally anyway and um both pictures have got a lot of heather in them but here we've got a lot of this red um, moss. We've got more moss overall actually in this photo compared to the previous ones. 
but um, that um, red moss there, that's a species of sphagnum, sphagnum capillifolium, there's loads of it in there, which shows that it's uh, a damper habitat as well. Generally speaking, the further west you go in our pine woods, the greater is the tendency for the ground flora to reflect damp conditions and to have more of that sphagnum in it. Uh, and within any particular area, it's common to find um, variation according to slope aspects with the northerly aspects, especially favouring the sphagnum and that more sort of damp, peathy community and south, especially steep south facing banks having um, a, um, a more kind of dry assemblage of heather and bell heather, maybe not quite as much flavour. So that's one ingredient of variation. Um, the next picture um, shows uh, on the top right, there's an example where it's more grazed because you have variation in grazing. Overall, the more grazed it is, the more grassy it's going to tend to be because they're very palatable dwarf shrubs like heather, bell heather and blaberry, all of which are very palatable to sheep and deer. They will get reduced in their quantity and correspondingly you'll get more grass. Um, so you'll end up um, with, you can end up with something like this picture on the top right, which is a lot of grass and moss and some ferns, a kind of ground flora that you can see also in um, woods of birch and oak in the uplands. It's pretty mossy, a lot of moss on those rocks. So if you, if, you know, that, that could equally be um, birch and oak woodland if, the, um, if, if you just saw the lower half of the picture and uh, it's, it's exactly, exactly the same. There's small herbs like um, heath bed straw and tormentil and grasses like sweet fernal grass and agrostis, the bent grasses. Um, that's on ground that's fairly well drained. In the bottom um, half of the page, there's some much damper grass, a damp, damper sort of grassy ground layer underneath the pines, sort of grassy and heathy as well on damper peaty soils. And in those places, purple moor grass can do really, really well. Big grass, big tufted grass with long leaves and um, long flower stems. And it um, dies off in the autumn to a sort of distinct pale buffy color. So it's very, very distinctive. And even in the summer when it's green, it's still pretty distinct because it's a big tufted grass. And some of our um, damp pine woods, especially in the West, can have uh, more linear purple moor grass dominated ground flora in places. And again, that is sort of the, uh, the pine counterpart of what we see in some of the broadleaf woods as well, with um, especially birch. Um, in the NBC, we call that W4, the Betula millennium woodland. Well, a particular form of the, of the pine woodland in W18 in the NBC can also have a lot of millennia as part of the sub-community W18D really. So um, but it, they, they cannot differently can the ground flora can look very heathy and there's variation in the heathy elements and then it can look very grassy especially if it's more grazed. Um, the next picture shows an example of um, an interesting thing lichen dominance on the ground under pines. Uh, this is a rare feature in Britain it's much more common to see this in the boreal forests of Scandinavia and Canada, where it looks like kind of snow on the ground, really. These lichens of the genus Cladonia, um, various species, Cladonia portentosa, Marbuscular, um, Rangiferina, even Ancea, listening to bed in there. Um, and um, this, this photo is taken on the, um, by the Moray Firth in some pine woods, one of the best sites for it, where there's actually the Culbin um, forest where it's plantation pine, um, even though it's plantation, it's still a, a fantastic example of this lichen rich pine wood. And there are more patchy examples of lichen rich pine wood elsewhere. When I say lichen rich, I mean in lichens on the ground rather than lichens on the trees. You get interesting lichens on the, on the trees um, scattered more widely through our pine woods but lichen abundance on the ground. Lichen, lichen dominance on the ground is a very rare thing in Britain generally. So here we've just got a glimpse of something that's a real boreal feature, Scandinavian, Canadian kind of thing. Fascinating to have that with, with in, in Britain in our 
the sort of northeast edge of Britain. Um, so that shows some floristic variation on the ground in the pine woods. And the next picture is looking at another aspect of um, the pine wood sort of appearance and structure which relates to an aspect of the ecology. And this is um, given that being an evergreen tree in this growth form is such that you get quite a dense lot of foliage um, on some of the branches. It holds quite a lot of snow in the winter and the, within the native range of pine that's coinciding pretty well with about the snowiest parts of Britain. So it's not surprising really to find that in some places um, when we have a lot of snow in a particular winter, the weight of that snow can break um, branches off. And after that winter, we can wander around pine woods and find loads of significant, really quite big branches that have just fallen, being, being brought down to the ground. Um, and, you know, when you see all that, you, then you think, well, yeah, the, uh, the growth form of the tree that, that we see isn't entirely dictated by its sort of maximum potential when, from when the thing germinates. Um, because other things are going to affect it, including big branches breaking off that kind of can sort of affect the shapes of the trees big time, really. And it's a fascinating thing, I think, another aspect of nature, kind of um, being a bit of a sculptor, really, in the, in the landscape, affecting the shapes of things. The next picture shows that um, that Japanese birch, just thinking about this, that's, um, you know, we can think, oh yeah, with those fallen bits of pine, we're getting another a glimpse of something that's more to do with the effects of snow on a big scale. And Britain is not the snowiest part of the world by any means, but we just have enough snow certainly to shape our pine trees and uh, be significant in the, the ecology of our um, native pine forests. Um, so it's, it's one end of a whole, big um, series of effects of snow in woodland which can get much more marked in some places such as here in northern Japan where the snow is so much more through the winter <clears throat> that um, the weight of it can weigh down these birches, see the birches on the right. Uh, from a British perspective we would quite naturally look at that and, and think to ourselves oh well I suppose it must be a very windy place you know the wind has blown those birches sideways although it would be a little bit odd because the um, the slope is going the other way uh, rather than this birch is being blown onto the slope. Anyway, we would naturally kind of think that, but no, this is snow. They get, they get loads and loads of snow um, there. So fascinating to see the effects. And that's the same species of birch that we saw in the earlier photograph with the tall stems. Here it's going about seven to 800 metres altitude and the previous photo is about five or 600 metres. Um, so, um, interesting thing there about that effect of snow in our pine wood is another glimpse of something that's a more global uh, scale, um, ecological effects, um, uh, more brought out more markedly in different parts of the world. Next picture has got some um, pine that's uh, a sort of dead wood pine, any kind of dead wood in any wood really is, um, is a good thing ecologically, all kinds of beetles, insects, um, bryophytes and lichens and fungi growing on them. And um, pine is no exception to that. And there are some really quite special things that are uh, being found on, um, on decaying pine. So always, always a good thing to have in a particular habitat to um, home in if we're interested in whatever little groups, they, or if, even if we're not interested. In, Get in there and find find stuff. So yeah, it's an important um, deadwood features um, significantly in the pine wood habitat. Um, and the next picture is some um, some juniper showing variation in growth form. It's an amazing shrub, juniper. Some uh, um, some individuals take this um, fastigiate columnar shape, um, uh, and others kind of more um, broadly spreading with drooping tips and others about sort of halfway between too. So, I mean, there's quite a big difference between that central one and the others. Um, you can never always predict really, we've just actually got some junipers here in our garden. We don't know if they're gonna come out columnar or, or broad. It's exciting to find out one day. They're very slow growing. Um, 
just hope we live long enough to find out. Um, there you can see there's a bit of a grazed effect in the ground floor actually in that place. Obviously it's somewhere where probably deer more like the sheep in that location that was up in Speyside. Um, we've been able to get in there and graze out or graze down the dwarf shrubs enough to allow a um, fair bit of grass to grow. So it's it's really quite grassy. It's pretty common actually to find um, fairly well grazed bits of juniper scrub, especially if it's, if it's open enough in places and the animals can get in. The next picture has got another example of it. This is generally a bit more spreading um, juniper here in place in Perth. And again, it's a fairly grassy um, bit of ground. In fact, that particular site has a reasonable amount of flushing coming through what would otherwise be rather acid soils, but uh, it can be quite heavy rich in places there, localised flushing. Um, and, but again, there is variation in the growth form of those junipers, some of them tall and not as obviously neatly columned, not like Lombardi poplars or anything, but um, still, still quite varied. And there's another one, um, next picture, and this is in the Lake District. Um, which, as I said earlier, it's a good habitat, a good area for juniper scrub. It looks very much like Snowdonia, a lot of the late districts, um, except uh, there's a lot more just juniper scattered around. Juniper is a very rare site in Wales. Um, so uh, it's scattered around some um, uh, otherwise rather heathy, dampish looking ground. Um, pretty grazed there as well by the look of it. The juniper, hair, juniper scrub isn't always in very grazed places. Um, another one on the uh, coming up the next picture, we're coming towards the end of this presentation actually. Um, this is in the um, sort of northern highlands, then Morriston, again showing that variation in um, the shape of junipers and this is another place where it's reasonably grazed and the juniper scrub is open enough for the animals to get into at least parts of it to lead to a rather grassy young um, ground layer um, and there's another one next one shows one an example where the ground layer really has been grazed down quite a lot pretty short um, you see a similar thing with some gorse scrub, you've probably seen quite a lot uh, in places where it's just more scattered bushes and holes in the scrub where the animals can get in. Very, very grazed and very mossy, actually. They graze down so much that the mosses are showing a lot more. Um, and that's probably on a bit of ground where the soil might be kind of basically acid but not quite as acid as on the more peaty ground beyond where it's more heathery and sort of damp heath and bog. Uh, okay the next picture is a more uh, a closer view um, of some um, less grazed juniper scrub looking close into the juniper bushes and there's not going to be very, very much that much grazing going on there because the um, the blaberry shrubs got all its leaves on and its stems are not sort of bitten right down it's just looking very quite lush and um, there's a good patch of um, the fern just to the right of center you might recognize the species um, it's the species of fern that is very palatable to the big herbivores well, it does look like something's got in there because the, the fern to the left, sort of down near the bottom, a bit left of centre, has, which is that, that one down towards the bottom left, by the way, is a broad buckler fern. That's right where the cursor is going now. Broad buckler fern, you can see where the top of that's been bitten off, um, probably by the deer, most likely. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, and as you probably figured, that other fern, um, that big tuft of it was hard fern. Hard fern, even though it's got a kind of a leathery texture, you might look at it in the field and think, oh, I wouldn't have thought animals would really like that, but they do. It's funny, the palatable, the palatable species, some of the most palatable species are things we wouldn't expect. They can be tough and leathery, or things like bramble with loads of prickles, you know, or dwarf shrubs with their woody stems. Um, but each to their own animals, um, like sheep and deer, have a different uh, preferred, um, what do you call, um, 
food menu or to to, to us. So um, yeah, but there, and then those other ferns so with slightly softer foliage, the butter fern, male ferns, those sort of things are also palatable. Um, ferns, so many species of ferns are palatable to animals like sheep and deer. So it's worth noting that when we're going into some woodland and we're thinking, I wonder how much grazing there has been in here. Um, bracken is an exception. They don't go much for bracken at all. So big lush dense of bracken doesn't indicate a, in itself doesn't indicate a low degree of um, grazing. Uh, but when we look at the tufted ferns, like a broad buckler fern on the left, that's a front of broad buckler fern that's been bitten off at the top, um, or the, um, the, the, the middle one, um, some male fern, there's another tufted species. Uh, we've got a young um, frond on the left in that middle photo and an older one to the right there. And you can see what the it's probably deer have done that is to bite off the, the side pinnae. Um, and all, all the way up in some cases, they haven't done it as much on the paler one because it's a younger frond and they haven't got around to doing it all yet. But, um, so little, making little funny kind of sculptures out of the, out of the ferns. And then the hard fern, they tend to, because it's a, it's a thinner frond, it's a rather smaller species, but um, so they just sort of bite the whole top off. They don't do any kind of side sculpturing that they might do with the male fern, they just bite the top off. Um, about early in the season, you can find a good number of, um, of the young fronds from this current year, looking that pale colour, not yet bitten off. But um, there's a bit more telling to go back later in the season, see how they fed. Or so often you can find that the young ones aren't bitten off, and you think, oh, it's not so much grazing here. But then you find some old fronds, old darker and slightly browner ones in the same tuft and, and that have been bitten a lot more. So hard ferns are a good indicator of um, grazing. Uh, and as I said, bracken isn't. Greater wood rush, I haven't got a picture of it here, but if you do find that, that's a really good indicator because it's a big lush thing, quite unmistakable, these big broad leaves and very palatable. And so how much um, those leaves are bitten off for the tips can give another indication of it. And if you find a lot of raspberry and a lot of honeysuckle or bramble, that would suggest that there's not a huge amount of grazing. Um, and the next slide is um, one of a couple of, um, we're just talking about those sort of, sort of sculptural forms there on the ferns, but also, um, and, and on the pines, the way the snow had brought branches down. Old junipers can look incredibly sculptural. This one, this is an example of one actually just up on the hill from where I live. Uh, that's on a slope facing kind of um, west more or less and it's quite dry and they can look kind of look like bone like sort of sculptures and pale old stems it's a very old one in a place where there's quite a bit of grazing actually um, just just from if only from an aesthetic point of view a very distinctive sort of facet of the varied range of appearances of juniper is this one with the um, these old bone-like stems and that contrasts with the um, the next slide uh, which is in a much more shaded sheltered place where there's, there's a juniper like an old juniper that's got a bit tumbled down um, that uh, because of the um, the greater amount of shade and shelter there's more humidity in there mosses and liverworts have been able to become very abundant you can get a lot of lichens on some of these junipers too um, so there's a whole great lot of um, epiphytic vegetation the purpley brown frulea tamarisci that you can see on some of those stems and the golden colored masses of mosses um, a lot of that can be hypnum cupressi for me but there's other kinds of mosses you can get on it um, and another thing you can find, actually, I just haven't got a photo of it here, although I have taken photos and I put, I put one on Twitter, a couple of them, actually quite recently, because um, Alison and I, we were doing some survey up in Aberdeenshire just um, in the last couple of weeks. And we came across junipers with some of this bright orange fungus, um, the, the people call tongs of fire. It's an absolutely incredible thing really vivid bright orange and it comes out in May uh, especially well seen if there's been a bit of rain 
and um, uh, extraordinary thing. It, it's it has a funny life cycle that involves another stage of it being on Hawthorne, on which it looks completely different. So you would never think it's the same thing. Um, it's, it's a lot more ordinary looking on Hawthorne, whereas on the Juniper, it's this the vivid orange. Tongs of Fire is a great name because it's all these little um, sort of linear, um, like these loads all sticking out, all of them bright orange. Uh, so in, at this time of year, if, the, if there's been a bit of rain, especially if things are moist, you can look out on junipers and see if you can find this stuff. I don't think it's very common. There'd be a lot of juniper without it, but this is something something that you can um, look for. Um, we're almost at the end because the next picture is the last one of just a close up of the the pine and the juniper foliage, showing the juniper leaves in whorls of three and the pines in those um, pairs, which uh, is a little sheet at the base holding them together, and their cones, just um, and the young um, juniper berries there, which will go that bluey colour later. Um, so um, that's that's it, really. Uh, I hope that's been <laughs> uh, informative or useful in some way uh, worth you spending this last whatever it is hour and uh, hour and a half um, yeah. um so i yeah. i think um we've got just a couple of sort of brief questions but obviously if anyone's got any more do put them in the chat or, or wherever you want to really at this point um uh, we just had one earlier saying um why is rhododendron a negative indicator if it occurs in native pine wood if it occurs in native pine wood, mm. um, oh, for well, for, for the same reasons as why it's a negative indicator to get it in any kind of woodland, because it's um, it thickens up and forms a very dense overshading canopy, so not enough light gets into the um, plants on the ground, and then of course it drops its leaves, um, evergreen leaves, which are very tough textured and they're quite toxic. Um, so they stay there forming a layer on the ground for quite a long time and it's, um, there's a toxicity in there. Basically it just kills ground flora and it spreads and spreads. It's, um, yeah, it's an absolute um, terror. Of, <laughs> why, of would, um, why would it, if it was occurring um, naturally in sort of its native area rather than in the southern area of England where it's obviously been planted, um, what what would be the management that had gone perhaps not correctly that would allow it to sort of take over like that? What's sort of suggesting that what's going on with the habitat that wouldn't be ideal if it's taken over? Oh, it's oh, oh, oh it's um it's not native anywhere in Britain. Oh, it isn't. No, right. No, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all it's all in, introduced um, in its in its, uh, in parts of the world where it is native. Obviously, everything else is different in those places, and so it would be an. Uh, yeah necessarily be an, an invasive species yeah yeah, yeah it's okay, a, it, i think yeah i think that was some of the confusion perhaps that yeah so yeah oh yeah no it's not native and any rhododendron. There, there are some other kinds of rhododendron um that people plant in gardens and parks and things that that aren't um invasive but then you don't see those around anything like as commonly and they're mostly in kind of garden parks sort of places but rhododendron ponticum with the pink flowers yeah is the the devil really <laughs> um the other question by the same person was just um which i briefly tried to answer so i'm just checking i got it right was just about um when you said by flushing coming through in a juniper scrub habitat um i assumed that you meant by a flush sort of a natural water spring or water seepage that would have brought nutrients in with it um is that what you were alluding to or yeah yeah it can be for maybe geological reasons a bit of a slightly different rock somewhere up slope or a little damp uh, spring or something bringing in it can be the enrichment of um, minerals and nutrients coming down usually quite localized although it can spread in some places you can get reasonable extent of rather flushed grassland that's that's quite a bit wider than um, just a, a narrow well-defined flush um, but um, still uh, sufficiently nutrient poor that the whole habitat is is not taken over by a small number of species that thrive in very nutrient rich conditions. So um, it's quite possible for say some juniper scrub, especially more than pine woodland, for some juniper scrub to be in a, 
in um, in a fine scale mosaic with grassland that uh, that is reasonably floristically rich because um, it can be quite it can be mineral enriched but really quite nutrient poor yeah and and, and botanically rich as a result of that and one of those photos of juniper's club that that one in perthshire I think it was about the second reasonably close up picture that I had there is an example of that because it's associated there with some grassland that is, it's like kind of flushed acid grassland that's um, nutrient poor from, as judged from its flora and botanically really very rich. Um, and I guess we haven't got any other specific questions, but there was something I was going to, because I mean, I've been learning about this habitat myself because it's not something I've had a lot of experience in being um, brought up on the South Coast and only going really as far as the Midlands. Um, so with regards to the juniper scrub aspect of it, um, as you said, it does occur in some, was it the Peak District or the Lake District or something? Um, Lake District. But it, in the yeah, it's, it's, an, uh, it's an upland habitat that we're talking about with NPMS, isn't it? That it mm. the, um, whereas I visited some juniper scrub um, down on the south coast, but it's on calcareous grassland. So again, we don't include that in NPMS. Um, habitats in that way would be marked down as dry calcareous grassland Absolutely, um, yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's just something I thought was a good point to raise at the end um, that this habitat that we've talked about um, in NPMS terms is mostly an, an, an upland associated habitats or, or or past the sort of Scottish border um, for the pine wood um, so if you do come across juniper scrub it, and you're not in an upland region, then it's probably going to be dry calcareous grassland. So that's something I learned recently myself. <laughs> yeah, that's that, that's right. And and when we talk about the upland as opposed to lowland um, area or region, um, that's not strictly dictated by altitude. Of course, it's um, because the further north you go, um, you can be into an area of an upland kind of environment as defined climatically um, at uh, increasingly low altitudes the further north you go. So some of the um, native pine and juniper habitats um, in northern Scotland is not far above sea level, but it's still in an area where it's basically a kind of upland type of environment because it's got an upland climate, it's cool, cool, yeah. um, more a kind of cool, stroke, moist, some combination of those that um, makes it way different to um, the lowland climate of the, of the south. Um, we just got another question, sort of on that same theme. Um, so, why does juniper scrub develop in some areas in the Aberdeenshire uplands, e.g., on the west side of Morven, whereas other areas on this hill are free of juniper? That's maybe. Um, uh, down to history of certain kinds of land use, maybe burning as well. But burning can dramatically affect some of the juniper scrub, but it, it it can it can be it can get it can get burnt out. But also, it can uh, burning of course leaves some bits of bare ground, and juniper isn't really very good at colonising areas where there's pretty dense vegetation because it's a slow growing thing and at the younger stage it's um, easily outcompeted by other things. So thing, something that opens up a bit of ground that can be to its benefit. Burning though is a bit of a knife edge thing because that can also kill populations of, of juniper. So I think history of burning and grazing because juniper is very palatable um, to um, deer and sheep as well. So it's probably probably down to various combinations of burning and grazing over the years that have led to um, juniper being more common in some places than in others. Okay. Probably quite complex interactions yeah. of them. Then. <laughs> yeah. um, just another brief question about um, when we say tufted in ferns, what do we mean? So obviously that's um, referring to the growth habit and essentially some fern species, well, um, quite a lot of them, will occur sort of coming from a central point and tuft outwards like that, mm. whereas some fern species will sort of almost grow in a sort of creeping form or, or in patches that, you know, marsh fern comes to mind for me when I think of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know if you want to say any more about that. That's ex exactly it. They all come from the same um, point, the same base, plant base on the ground. Shuttlecock ferns, people often refer to yes, a lot yeah. of the um, dryopterists and um, 
the Ethereum, the lady fern things, as um, shuttlecock ferns because they do look like that, don't they? Yeah, they're upside. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, but they're but they're also um, you also see that growth form with uh, with the hard fern and with lots of grasses like purple moor grass. Yes, I was going to uh, say grasses are also described as being maybe tufted or or sort of yeah creeping. Yeah. Whereas something like bracken, uh, you can you can take you can trace each frond just down to the ground, as, and there's just one frond, and then a bit further on, there's another one, another one. And it was it was an oak fern that's not tufted. That's, more, that's more. right. Oak fern behaves; it, it kind of spreads around and forms patches in the same way that bracken does, a sort of underground rhizome, shooting up, um, uh, putting up single shoots here and there, so you get a patch of it. So you know, they're, they're not aggregated into little little clusters, little tufts. Okay, brilliant. Well, I think that's all the questions that have come in. Um, I'll just remind everyone that this is obviously being recorded and I'll be putting it up on the YouTube channel probably tomorrow. Um, so you can rewatch it or send it to anyone else you think would like to learn. Um, and Ben, you'll be with us again very soon, I'm sure, for another <laughs> Habitat training session. Um, but also we have got one on Friday evening with Dominic Price uh, for lowland grasslands and looking at dry acid grasslands particularly. So um, join us for that. There's lots of space still for registration. But I just want to say thank you again, Ben, for a very informative and excellently done presentation. I know that we get lots and lots of very positive feedback. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, well, we'll see you at the next one. And thanks everyone for listening and have a good lunch as it's nearly lunchtime. <laughs> So. Good. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good. All right. Bye. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.